Hey everyone, it's Crystal Hefner and I'm on Hollywood Raw talking about my book, Only Say Good Things, where I dive deep into my life at the Playboy Mansion. So stay tuned, full of surprises, really looking forward to it. Welcome to the Hollywood Raw YouTube page, guys. We're happy to have you here. Make sure you like, subscribe, leave us comments, do all the stuff. What are you waiting for? Let's go. I got a drug addiction to feed. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Hollywood Raw Podcast. I'm Dax Holt. Over there is Adam Glenn. We got a good podcast. We got a great podcast for you today. Very excited. Adam has been talking about this guest, just talking my ear off all week because he has been enthralled with her book and saying, I can't wait to talk to her. She's had the most fascinating life. I mean, I'll let you take it from here, dude, because yeah. literally all of our conversations over the last week has been about having Crystal Hefner on and how much you're enjoying the book. Yeah, Dex. I want to. I'm going to just let's get right into her because uh, our guest today is a, she's a former Playboy playmate. Um, she just wrote this incredible book called uh, "Only Say Good Things: Surviving Playboy and Finding Myself." She's part of the Hugh Hefner Foundation. Uh, I think this book is easily going to be a New York Times bestseller. She's doing some pretty incredible things, you know, post her play Playboy career. Uh, Crystal Hefner, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Good, good, yeah. He is so excited that he actually skipped us reading a review, which we do every single week, but he is skipping <laughs> normal protocol because he's just excited to have you. I'm going to read a review real fast just because that's what we do on our podcast, Adam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, let me read this Sorry. real fast. This one is from Donnie H71. Five stars, so good. Love hearing Everything about Hollywood and behind the scenes, the personal stories of people you both have met. So interesting. Keep up the great work from Don H. Thank you, Don, for leaving this review. Now, back to Crystal. Back to Crystal. Crystal, thank you for joining the podcast. Like I was telling Dax, I told everyone before, I read your book. It was a good book. It's a solid book. It's a quick read because I say it's a quick read because I couldn't put the book down. It's just so well put together. And I was so impressed with your writing and also how deep you got regarding your journey in your during this era of your life. So thank you for joining us. Where are you now, by the way? I am in West Hollywood. So I live in LA. I live between LA and Hawaii. So I'm just hanging out on the couch at home. I'm with my little dog. She's taking a nap Aww, by me. What kind of dog is that? She's adorable. Uh, she's a King King Charles Cavalier. She's 10 now. So, <laughs> so cute. So <laughs> Crystal, let's get right into it. I got to ask the question that everyone wants to know. I think everyone so questions this. And it's, I think people are just so curious about this. When you live in the Playboy Mansion, you have that food, that kitchen. Can you just call that line, just get whatever food you want, whenever you want? <laughs> yes. That is yes. so sick. That is was, so cool. And was the food good? Like good food coming up? Yeah. Or this is like, I mean, I got the line, but like the food kind of sucks. Yeah, it was more, I mean, it was very American style. You know, that's the kind of style Hef really liked. He liked the... um fried chicken and the pot roast and <laughs> that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of um, things like that on hand, but it was a little bit of, of a double-edged sword because when I first got there, I'm like, wow, I can order whatever I want. I'd be getting grilled cheese and all kinds of fries. And, um, but then I gained weight. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> I can't, <laughs> I can't uh, do both. So definitely cut back on the food did they have like options like lobster like i got to imagine lobster is an expensive thing to have on hand just in case someone wants it but did they have lobster or whatever yeah and whatever they didn't have if you let them know a little bit in advance then they would order it for you so if you're like oh i really want lobster on friday and it's wednesday then they'll make sure it's there if they don't have it um and then hef had a menu I think it had maybe like 25 menu items. So he would call them and be like, oh, I want a number five, like BLT or whatever. And they would prep like a roast every week and um, just all the menu items just in case Hef were, were to order one of them, which I, I thought was very interesting. I like that he has it, his own numbers for his own house. I'll take a number five with fries, please. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> there, there's a like a laminated menu that just like would pull out and you just pick what, what you wanted. It's very oh, interesting. so funny. 
And did, could you yeah. do that if they were in the house? Or did you have to be like a girlfriend or a wife? Like, did you have to be someone of importance to be able to order or anyone in the house could order? Anyone who was invited up can – There, it was like a restaurant-style kitchen. Anybody who was invited up could order whatever they wanted. And I think for a while that's what happened. I think – I heard the rumor that <laughs> that's probably true that it was Jack Nicholson's drive through that he would just drive in the front gate, order something, pick it up, and leave with it. So <laughs> it was very <laughs> accommodating and giving it to his his guests for sure. That is so cool. I mean, if you just say, and would they deliver to your room so you wouldn't have to go downstairs to the kitchen? You say, I want a protein shake. They'd make the smoothie and someone knocks on the door with the smoothie. Yeah, I always felt super awkward when that happened because I, you know, I just came from a regular life. You know, I lived in an apartment, so uh, I'm like, oh no, no, don't worry, Sheila. Like, I'll one of the butlers. I'm like, I'll come down and get it myself. <laughs> like, I don't yeah, need full service. What do we? I get it. So yeah, the weird. Like, I was like, talking- I don't, I don't like the vibe. It's just, it was just awkward. I'm like, these, these people are just like me. I don't want them to. <laughs> yeah, be serving so- me. I no, I totally understand the uncomfortable situation of you kind of put in that and you're like you feel weird, like you want to help out essentially rather than be served. It's it's like, no, you you're we serve you. You don't have to work. But I, I, I get it. Yeah, I'm like I could never be in the kitchen and cook something. Like it just wasn't a thing that I could do. So Yeah. So again, I love this book and it's such a great read because you paint a really good picture in this book. I mean, you're so honest with everything from um you're growing up, you know, your, your, your relationship with your father to actually how you got into the Playboy Mansion to the romantic part of your relationship with Hugh to dealing with his death, which was a really, that was a tough read for myself. I mean, and I can only imagine as a person who wrote it, but as a, as a reader to hear your perspective of it, it's just, it's a, it's a really unique perspective that you have from being there. And I think from the outside looking in as you know, Dax and I are journalists, we had one way of looking at it, but from your own, from your perspective, it's such a unique perspective that makes me consider all things and that Hef did and his legacy. So I really commend you on the the bravery of writing this book, and that kind of goes into the title, "Only Say Good Things," because mm-hmm. when Hugh Hefner passed away, he said to you, "Only say good things." So when you wrote this book, and actually you end this book, say, "Hey, I'm going to just speak my truth." When you wrote this book, how do you feel now? Are you nervous about how Hef? family's going to react to it are you nervous like how hef is thinking about you writing this book what what, you know what's what's your mind going through um i think when i was at the mansion i felt i had things to lose or people to upset and uh now i the book has has been healing for me it's been nice to write and to just tell the story of something so complex from another person's perspective, I think is really important because have controlled the narrative is of his life for so long. And, you know, I fed into that narrative, like, okay, just exactly how Hef wants it. Only say good things, push the agenda that Hef wants to push. But then, then after me too, and everything started happening and I was in therapy myself trying to figure it out. And with my psychology background, I, I just thought, I want to tell a version of the story that people haven't heard before uh, from from the female perspective and kind of do a more of a deep dive dive into the psychology behind it. And um, I think it I think it came out just as I intended. And I'm proud of it. And it's it's very interesting. (laughs) So, yeah. Have you heard any anything from family members or anything like his son or anything? Are they nervous about your book coming out? Have they read it? Do you did you send them a screener copy before <laughs> it goes out? <laughs> I haven't. I'm like, I'll just let them read it with everybody else. But um I I spoke to Marston on uh, my podcast that I have. Mm-hmm. And that was interesting. Marston is similar to me in the way that we're kind of both introverted and observers and we're just tell the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, Marston's on oh, my dad's difficult, was difficult at times and other things about him were good. We're just telling the truth. And I think the others realize that there's good and bad. He wasn't, he wasn't all good and he wasn't evil. So it was, it was a mix. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so I actually never been to a Playboy party. Dax, you were at a Playboy party, right? Yeah, I went to one. It was I mean, yeah. for me going to the Playboy Mansion was just a really cool experience because there was this allure that you know everyone knows about the Playboy Mansion and the parties that have been there for so many years that for me driving into because we we actually got like the pass that we could drive up to like, oh. the, front of the house and park in the front of the house um and it was just so cool to be walking into the backyard and see the grotto and see all these things that i've seen on tv and um and, and i was there uh kendall or not kendall uh what kendra. Her name? kendra was kendra. there Kendra was there partying in Paris and Snoop Dogg and all these people. Oh, and my gosh. For me, I was just like, holy shit. Like, I, this is a, a life moment right now that I am trying to take in. But I'm curious as someone who lived in the house, you know, what was it like inside the home? Because, like, I, I got to see the outside. I didn't go indoors, you know, and it's got this allure. <laughs> was it as cool to be there once you're living in it as it was as it is like with the allure? um well first what year were you there that's cool like, this was remember? 2000 i'm gonna say 17 maybe okay so i was there no 2007 i'm sorry i didn't say seven, seven? 2007 <laughs> the, yeah like right like that makes sense 2007 yes okay yeah i was there in 2008 so we just missed each other okay <laughs> but the, yeah, the parties were very interesting um mm -hmm. As Hef got older, like he would just go to the parties for maybe half an hour and then go back up. And I wasn't really allowed to go hang out at the parties without him. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the parties, people could rent out the mansion if it was related to a charity. So Hef would have his personal parties, and then there were rented parties. Um, and so there were there were so many parties all the time, and. It got annoying. <laughs> if I'm being honest, you're inside. It's an old house, so the walls are thin the windows aren't sealed properly and you just hear the like thump 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 all night long and just there's drunk people everywhere <laughs> and and I, and I know they had to like cut out cut it off at like 2 a.m so i'd just be waiting i'm like oh, i can't sleep and then i'm like oh 2 a.m okay it's, it's quiet now and for me it's hard to sleep or go about my business when there's just all this stuff happening around me so hef had no problem with it he could sleep and have people in the next room the same room <laughs> but um why were you not hard. allowed to go to the parties um hef didn't want me there without him mm -hmm. maybe he thought i would run off <laughs> with somebody else but um yeah so we would go down together and then we'd come back up and i wasn't really allowed uh to go back that's, out that's interesting yeah yeah but i guess after a while i would i wasn't really into the parties but they, yeah. There were some great parties. I know that they, for Halloween, they would transform the whole tennis court into a haunted house that was incredible. And um, Midsummer Night's Dream, I think they would spend like $400,000 just for one night for a party. It's crazy. So, so what, yeah, when you were at these parties, though, again, I'd never been to a Playboy party for, in my head because I've read books about Playboy in the history. It, are people... Like, it sounds weird because it's so cliche because now it's legal. Are, is there people just smoking weed everywhere? Is there drugs around? Like, what's the yeah. vibe like at the party? Are people pass around Coke. Is there even Quaaludes, like even that type um, of drug? Or I've never – the Quaalude thing I've heard about, but I've never seen them. I don't even – I still don't really even know what that is. But um, definitely the, the whole place smelled like weed. And, yeah, people passed around stuff, and I'm sure people were doing – cocaine or no nobody checked there was no screening or security screening really for anything so people could have brought anything in yeah was you there ever a moment was there ever a moment where there was a party going on and you were involved and you're just like this is crazy this is my life right now or you're looking around and hugh hefner's on one side and then i'm assuming there's crazy celebrities all around was there ever that moment that you had kind of had like a, a pinch me moment yeah, it was weird. You know, you're we sitting in like a banana and then, oh, make way like David Hasselhoff's coming to say hi to Hef. And then in the next second, it's like, 
Bill Maher is coming to sit down and have a quick chat. And then in comes Buzz Aldrin, who was like the second man on the moon. And it was just like Quincy Jones and Smokey Robinson. And it's just the weirdest mix of people that you wouldn't even think like go together. Yeah. Would show up at these parties. And yeah, I thought it was cool. It was weird, but it was also cool. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you're with those people. Are those guys, like, do you see them, are they there for the party? Are they there for the women? Which, obviously, there's a lot of women there who are trying to get Hughes, tef, uh, Hughes' attention or maybe Playboy's attention. Are they there to hook up? Or are they there just for the party? And did you see a lot of them, like, kind of partying like Hugh where, you know, like you wrote in the book, Hugh, like, multiple women. Were those guys kind of having their fun, too, as well? Is, like, every guy having their own mini sort of orgy? And I, hate to I say, think I say a lot of them. I think a lot of them tried to kind of be an offshoot of Hef. You know, I know Corey Feldman would show up with like five girls and <laughs> I, I don't know what they did after the party or whatever, but <laughs> um, there were people that liked that lifestyle and wanted to be a part of it for that, for sexual reasons. I I'm yeah. sure um, those certain celebrities, they always just a little bit grossed me out. Um <laughs> They still do. Uh, but there, there were people that just stopped by and just were curious and um, seemed a bit more normal, less pervy. <laughs> See, to me, that's a great perspective, though, because here you are on the inside. You're a girl. You're, you know, obviously you and there's a bunch of other attractive females. But if a guy came to the party like a celebrity, would you be? Yeah, you're a fan of them. But would you be kind of creeped out by them coming to the party because you're there for you're there for maybe potentially to partake in some fun, maybe sexual activity, or are they there just to check out the scene? Yeah, I'm not really sure. Like I've, there's been some definitely a lot of celebrities, A-list celebrities, they'll show up in Hallow on Halloween and have masks on. So people don't know who they are, but you know, I've seen them like hit people's butts or like try and get flirty or try and be weird. And I, the scene is just, when I was there, it was pre me too. So it's, sure. Yeah, people feel, felt like they could get away with more things then. Um, I don't think it's as much like that now. But, yeah, I think it was a place where a lot of big celebrities could go to feel like they could let loose and, I don't do whatever. <laughs> so in one of the, our conversations, Adam was telling me, we only got one screen of the book, so I didn't get to read it, unfortunately. <laughs> he hogged it all to himself. Um, but he was telling me that the producers of Girls Next Door tried to basically start trouble, as a, at least what you had said, between you and Bridget, who was one of his girlfriends. Oh, not, well, not, uh, oh, I'm, well, not Bridget, really. It was Holly, right? It was oh, I, Holly. Sorry, yeah. Oh, Holly. Um, yeah. Sorry, I would. Uh, did, do you have a relationship with her at this point? Have you guys put things in... I'm just curious where your relationship with Holly is at this moment. Uh, we were following each other for a while on Instagram. When her book first came out, I was at the mansion and I was like very team Hef and he could do no wrong. And it's not until I left that I, that I realized, okay, a lot of what she's saying is true. And mm -hmm. a lot of the ways, you know, she was controlled. I was controlled. Um, we were friendly for a while and we're following each other on Instagram, but um, it took I separation like... from the mansion to understand other people's perspectives, basically. Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to get along with everyone. I feel mm -hmm. that we can share stories, but um, now we've unfollowed each other because of some disagreement about dog birthday parties. What? <laughs> I know. <laughs> what, what does that even mean? That you someone had a dog birthday and didn't invite the other person or what? <laughs> <laughs> they talked about on their, their podcast, they have a podcast and they spoke about being at the mansion and be on the show and planning all these dog birthday parties or planning events where they're like matching their outfit and they have to organize their outfits and organize the party and get decorate and all the stuff that I'm personally not interested in. Yeah. Like that was never my thing. Like I hated wearing those stupid outfits and going <laughs> to those parties. But I think... Because I had said, oh, you know, I'm not into that. I, I'm not into dog birthday parties. Like, I don't want to plan a whole party for my dog. Like, I just, I'm not into it. And then, so they, they, then they went on their podcast and they said, you know, F people that don't like dog birthday parties. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just, I'm like, how old are we? How old are we? 
Like I'm, I'm almost 38. They're like 40s and 50. I'm like, how old are we? So I just, I'm like, I just got to block these girls. And, um, I don't talk to Holly and Holly and Bridget. Uh, when I very first did the girls next door show season six, that was kind of thrown on. They, the first thing they made me say is, um, I'm not the new Holly. Holly's the old me. So I think mm-hmm. that kind of started the, the riff, but uh, and then she also named her daughter Rainbow. They said, isn't that a stripper name? And they, she said, no, stripper name is Crystal. <laughs> so oh, it's been this like petty thing for years. And <laughs> I just I just want to get along. Uh, Kendra's cool. She's just trying to move on with her life. Mm-hmm. So Kendra and I get along. The Shannon twins and I, they were also at the mansion. I f- feel for them. They were sisters. Mm. That's like we're girlfriends together with Hef. That's disturbing. But so, I, yeah, I let re- me, yeah, I'm sorry. So you mentioned the, the the Shannon sisters, which you say is disturbing. You mentioned your relationship in the book, and they weren't the kindest to you. And you were looking for that kind of friendship to have a partner in the mansion, someone you could kind of talk to. And you didn't have that with the Shannon sisters. Were they? And they also they were in there before you. So they knew how to kind of get out of stuff, in and out of stuff. They knew they would say, oh, yeah, we have to go visit family. They had, a, they had a life outside the mansion. In fact, you even said in the book that they're the ones who kind of taught you about the allowance. Is that right? You got allowance from being in the Playboy Mansion? Yeah, yeah. So they were I, – I forget how long before me they were there. But, um, yeah, not, not too long because I, I still remember Holly, Bridget, and Kendra's stuff being moved out. Um, but yeah, they said, oh, every Friday Hef gives us allowance. You go into the bedroom and you ask him for it. And, and I'm just like, okay. (laughs) 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 And then they would just kind of leave and they'd be gone, but they were, they weren't there very long. And I think it's because I'm like, okay, Hef wants somebody that's like with him all the time and likes all the things he likes. So I think we just kind of separated off that way. And then. Did, they moved did you out. talk it about was how much allowance was a week? It was like, I don't remember, like, like a thousand every Friday uh, it started off as. And then I think it went to 2000 every Friday and then like 2500. And eventually I, I told have hey, I don't like this. I don't want to be like, hey, give me money. So I'm like, just direct deposit that. <laughs> <laughs> It's weird because like all your living expenses are paid for, but this is like so you can leave and go shopping and buy yeah. stuff, right? I buy outfits for parties at Trashy Lingerie. That was the name of the place, but yeah, the, that's a popular the outfits, location. Do you see? It's on La Cienega. Mm-hmm. It's like, Paris Hilton uh, gets her Halloween costume there almost every year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're like a thousand dollars. The place is called yeah, yeah. Trashy Lingerie, but it's it's expensive. That's so funny. <laughs> Um, just the so idea of the, even the, the, an the allowance is, is wild. And how many women would come in and ask for the allowance? Maybe four when I was okay. there. Dang. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, you, you talk about your life growing up into the book. And, you know, you, you mentioned your father where you had a great relationship with him. And he, you know, obviously he left too soon. And how did, explain to people how that relationship with your dad, you losing your father made you kind of look at Hugh as, and correct me if I'm wrong, I just want to understand it because you know this better than I do, but you looked at Hugh as more like a father figure, which is weird because he became your husband, um, which is also sort of a weird thing because to you wasn't a a real marriage again. But how did all that affect you wanting to be, you losing your father wanting to be a playmate? How did that all come about? If you can explain that. Um... I honestly feel that it was just wanting to feel like I belonged somewhere. And I think sometimes people value that even more than love. You know, like they, you just want to feel that you belong and that you're accepted. Um, my mom and I, we bounced around all different places. In the book I talk about, we just rented one bedroom in a different family's home and you just never felt like you belonged anywhere. I just felt like you were floating. And with Hef, I felt like, wow, this is a big, 
beautiful, powerful place. And this, this man is making me feel accepted and like I belong here. And to me, I, that was kind of like the sweetest reward just to, just to feel that way. But, you know, over time, nothing was what it seemed. So yeah. Get, get into the, the marriage. Cause Adam was telling me, you, you talked about how this marriage was kind of sprung on you and you, you, you didn't know about the proposal. Can you walk us through how that all kind of played out? Yeah. I, I remember one random day going into Mary's office, half secretary, and she asked me what kind of ring I like. And I'm like, Oh, what do you mean? She's like, Oh, like what kind of ring, what kind of diamond shape do you like? And I said, I don't know, like square, you know, I always felt like I had to answer them or I had to, you know, I never wanted to get in trouble. So I'm like, Oh, square. And she said, Oh, no, no, no. You don't want square. You want round because I guess the light hits it and it sparkles more. And I'm like, oh, okay, round. And I left her room. And then at Christmas, Hep handed me just a music box. It was like the, a little mermaid music box. And I opened it and there was a ring inside. And he said, I hope it fits. And I, I think I was 25 or 26. And, and I just thought, oh, okay, well, I think this is him like asking me to marry him. And, uh, yeah, and I, I put it on, and everyone started taking pictures. <laughs> it was like a little big, and that was it. And I said, right, "Well, I guess if I'm, I guess if I'm here, and I'm, I'm not. Either I have to leave, <laughs> or I'm going to marry him." Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So it, I mean, I got to feel like there. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure on that. It's interesting that there was never like, "Will you marry me?" in there like the words actually coming out was kind of interesting and (laughs) how it all just kind of played itself out so wild maybe he was afraid to ask in case i said no (laughs) (laughs) could be it's true (laughs) like i won't even ask (laughs) yeah so as soon as you get engaged how quick did they was the prenup talk brought up to you um i think I'm, I'm trying to think what came first, if it was the prenup talk or the the talk about the show that they were filming for Lifetime called Marrying Hef. And I heard Kevin and the producer talking about they were going to make $800,000, like the network was going to give that money to Prometheus Entertainment, which was Kevin Burns and Hef and Kevin were going to split that any, you know, which way. And they he handed me a talent fee paper of like 2500 And I, I so told him- I, You got paid how- Kef was making how much money? He's making uh, so four hundred thousand dollars, and you're making twenty five hundred dollars. He was making eight hundred thousand dollars for the marrying Hef episode, but I don't know how how much he's like what the split was with him and the producer. Mm-hmm. But between them, eight hundred thousand dollars, and I was given a twenty five hundred dollar talent fee paper paperwork, mm-hmm. and I remember mentioning to him like, "Hey, I don't expect." like half, I don't expect anything like that, but maybe something like I'm going to be the one going to the flower mart and picking the flowers and the dress and doing all this stuff and planning all this stuff. I really don't want to do. I'm kind of introverted and I don't want to be planning this 300 person wedding. And, um, you know, maybe like $10,000 that would make, would make me feel more appreciated. And that's when he said like, Oh, what are you in this for? And that's what it kind of, it started going a little bit because I had never asked him for anything. You know, sure. And, uh, yeah, it started getting weird. And then he gave me the the prenup. He sent me to an attorney. Um, the, I don't know, one of Hef's doctors recommended the attorney wouldn't sign it. They said it was grossly unfair. Uh, it said something about, you know, you have no right to anything. You have no right to the bunny head logo. <laughs> like, well, okay. <laughs> like I want to start selling playboy shirts. Like it's so strange. So I had to go to a second attorney that would sign it, uh, sign it off for me. Um, yeah. And then we got married and. Sorry. During that time, I mean, did, did you feel like you were just a plot point for a TV show? Like if they are wanting to create an episode around half getting married and it kind of felt like you were a pawn, it's at least me listening to you talking. Is that what it felt like being in the situation? Yeah. Yeah. But I think I didn't completely understand it all the way then, you Mm -hmm. know, 
but now now I do. Now I realize more, but you know, I something in me, some kind of fire or something like I just started doing stuff on my own. I started, you know, social media, Instagram was kind of a thing, Vine. So I started making money on social media. I came out with a few different clothing lines. And then I started buying real estate and I would have a, you know, I opened a LLC so I couldn't be traced. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to start making money on my own. And that's what I did. And it got to the point where it's like, okay, I have enough money to where I don't even need to be here for anything. Like I can leave and, you know, I already had a few million dollars. I'm like, I don't need to be here anymore. But, but it got to the point where Hef was getting older. I'm like, I, I can't leave him. And it's weird. Yeah. I don't know if it's Stockholm syndrome. I don't know what happened, but I didn't leave him. And I was there until the very end. Yeah. If you only got paid, so you're saying for that show when marrying Hef, you got paid $2,500 roughly around. You said, is that the number you finalized on it for that show? Was it 2,500? It was something like that. Yeah. Something like that. How much did you get for Girls Next Door? Nothing. You didn't get a dollar for Girls Next Door. No. He made us feel like we should be so lucky to to be part of that, and that was it. Okay. So, Sheesh. talking about the end and sticking with him, was there any relationship towards the end? Did I mean? Did you did you guys chat? Was there ever like a mm-hmm. real tight emotional connection with you two? I think that he loved me the best way he knew how. Yeah, you know, I just I I think it was hard for him to really love somebody else and really put any focus on anybody else. You know, he just had so much focus on his his own self and his own legacy and everything about him for so many years that I think that's just all he knew. But yeah. he tried the best he could, I think. And the people well, you, that would surround him, did you feel like people genuinely cared about him or everyone was in it for themselves? Um, in it for themselves. Uh, I think there were a few people that genuinely cared about him, but I think other people mainly saw it as like a country club. You know, you come up mm-hmm. and you get free drinks, dinner, movies, hang out with some pretty girls. I think it's mostly... Because when I have got older, we we whittled down the list and people would get angry when they were told they can't really come up anymore. And so I think a lot of people took advantage and saw it as a given. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm sure have had a, got given a lot of gifts over the years. All those gifts that people probably would give to Hugh. And I'm sure you got saw some insane gifts from, from art to memorabilia. Whatever happened to that stuff? Where, like, when they were given to, what would Hugh do with it? And then, whatever happened to all those materials? Most of it was stolen. Most really? of it was stolen by staff. I realized that. I think I mentioned that in the book. He was given all kinds of art and gifts and different things. A lot of tchotchkes he'd just put in his bedroom, but like the bigger pieces, the art, uh, he wasn't really much into fine art or anything like that. So a lot of the nice pieces, he wouldn't even know the difference and he would just have it. Oh, send that to the the storage or send that to the, um, wherever it's random things. Uh, someone brought him some of Michael Jackson's hair, like the randomest (laughs) things. And he would say, send it to storage, send it to storage. And one day I decided to like, where is this storage, this magic storage somewhere in Santa Monica? And I went over to check on it and it, the lock had been broken off and it looked like people had been kind of going in and out of there for a while. Um, And I didn't have the heart to tell him that everything was gone, was, was stolen. So he died knowing, like not knowing that, whatever he sent to storage was never went there. Wow. That's so That's sad. A, it is sad. It's so sad. I feel bad for you. Cause that was stuff for, well, and also his kids, you know, that was stuff for you guys to kind of experience and cherish. Um, you were also known and you were also known as the runaway bride. And before you got married to Hugh Hefner, you ran off. And just because you weren't really happy the situation, you weren't comfortable being in that position. You didn't know if you wanted to have that life. You ran off with Dr. Phil's son, um, and you started because you started a relationship with him. It wasn't it? Wasn't from what I understand. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it wasn't romantic at first. He kind of 
you had a you had a bond with this guy uh, with Dr. Phil's son. He, and actually the guy's name is Jordan, right? He's now married to Morgan Stewart, uh, the TV host, the rich kids. What did Dr. But when you, before you ran off, you had a conversation with Dr. Phil because you had a relationship with his son. What did Dr. Phil tell you that Macy clicked to you that said, you need to leave? <laughs> so crazy. Uh, yeah, so I I didn't know who to turn to, and I had I'd started speaking to Jordan. I wasn't really attracted to him. I just thought he was nice and whatever. And he it was around the time when I, the prenup stuff was happening, the sh- the stuff with the marrying Hef show, and I just I don't know. I just felt a bit trapped. And he told me, "Oh, you, you need to come up and talk to my dad." So I went up to you know all the way up in the hills, <laughs> the, top, <laughs> the very top, and sat outside with Dr. Phil on his couch and, you know, he did his like, you're a 25 year old woman and you shouldn't be trapped and you have your whole life ahead of you and all this stuff. And I, and he gave me this like confidence to just go back and like get all my stuff and leave. Mm-hmm. And in retrospect, I'm like, okay, this, this guy's son like had a crush on me and he kind of convinced me to leave. And, that whole situation was very strange because you think of Dr. Phil as this person that like helps people and that you can trust. And it was hard. It was hard seeing, you know, they're, they're so rich. The guy's a billionaire from that show. And Jordan at that time had a black Amex, like unlimited, you know, those like heavy ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And, uh, And he used it all the time for everything to get him. He would trash hotel rooms and just use the, card and i'm like doesn't dr phil have episodes on enabling children and why you shouldn't enable children and and so then i've gone on to this other thing that's just a total like head spin so so um yeah i don't think that situation was any better and then i went back to the mansion and how did that go going back to the mansion uh i think hef had missed me because as soon as I got back, he respected me so much more. Mm-hmm. Really yeah. respected so, me so what, much What What do you think was the connection? Because, listen, there was a lot of women <clears throat> that have obviously gone in and out of the Playboy Mansion, and he's met so many women in his life. What was it about you that made marriage material? And I'm just, I'm just curious, what, what was it that was different between you and other people in his life? I don't know. And I've been trying to figure that out. And maybe because I didn't want certain things as bad as other people, maybe there was like, I don't know if there was like, uh, I don't know. I, I watched this, this is woman who like does all this dating advice and she's like, Oh, the first thing you say is like, I won't marry you. And then the people want to marry you or something. Cause I never, I never asked for it. I never wanted anything like that. Um, it was something that was a little scary to me. Um, I don't know. And I, I try to figure out, I even spoke to an astrologist that uh, she, she was like, oh, uh, Hef had a lot of fire signs and you have a lot of earth. So you like grounded him and you made him feel safe and comfortable. And I don't know. I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it out. Maybe it's because I made myself, molded myself into anything and everything he wanted. You know, I'm watching every single old movie and, you just whatever he wanted. And I think for someone who's like a bit narcissistic, that's maybe a positive thing. (laughs) You know, what's interesting thing I noticed about Hugh Hefner. And again, I never met him. I never saw him, but from the video clips I would see and from the shots I would see every time he would say hi to a woman. um, And again, I could be wrong. And Crystal, you know this better. I felt like he always kissed him on the mouth. Like he was oh, hi. He always kiss him on the lips. Did did you notice that? Was that something you noticed when he would say hi to a girl? He would always kiss him on the mouth. Yeah, he would always do that, and like his mouth would go toward them, like open. <laughs> like oh, stop kissing everyone. Yeah, you know I don't do know you, what it was. I, I have a question for you because I know that you you still have the Hefner last name. If yeah. you were to get remarried at one point, would you get rid of that name? Or are you planning on keeping the Hefner last name because it's synonymous with you now? 
I don't know. I've been asked that question and I get a lot of comments on uh, Instagram. It's like, if it was so bad, then why do you still have that name? And you know, I started all my social media, Crystal Hefner. When we got married, Mary immediately had all my na- my stuff changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a friend that got married like shortly after and she said, oh, can you help me? I don't know how to change all my information. I'm like, me either. <laughs> like, <laughs> they just did it all for me. Um, yeah, I've definitely thought about it. It's something that I, I want to go back to, uh, probably my my name, you know, I, it's the same initials. Um, I think if I get married one day, I don't think I would take somebody else's name. I've had enough of that. <laughs> yeah. And do you, sorry, I, it, do you speak to Mary still? So Mary died and her okay. replacement I, was, I didn't know what to say. I was like, I don't know if she's still around. So how do I ask no, this no. question? She died like just as fiercely as she lived. Like she's just like, she got sick and she had to be on a ventilator. She was like, take this all off me. I've had enough. <laughs> like, okay. Um, but Amanda Warren replaced Mary and I got along with her really well. We were a lot closer in age and I think she was kind of the sanity for me when I was there. And do you still speak to her? Yeah, yeah. She's on the board of the foundation with me. Oh, okay. I'm still on the board of them. <laughs> what gotcha. do I do? <laughs> gotcha, um, gotcha. Do you do you think every cover girl has been with Hugh Hefner sexually? Like if, if you know, you were there, every single girl that was on the cover, would they come upstairs with you guys to Hef's room? There were definitely girls that would sleep with Hef trying to get the playmate, you know, centerfold. Uh, there were girls that they would just keep coming up and sleeping with Hef and just hoping, you know, and, and it would be a girl that, you know, maybe she might not make it, but because of the extra effort, like she did, um, they're also before me, Hef was married to Kimberly mm-hmm. Conrad for a long time. Yeah. And during that era, that's when like Pamela Anderson, Jenny McCarthy, like those women kind of came through and they didn't sleep with half because, you know, he was married. They showed up. There's toys and kids everywhere. And so I think that that era, not so much, but, um, but yeah, it definitely people, people would come in at a certain point and be like, be all over half. And I'm like, okay, what do you want? Are you, what do you, you, you want to be a playmate? You want to, I'm like yeah. fast tracking it for them. I'm like, I know this girl is going to be a no. So let me just send her for a test shoot and just get it over with. Or I know this girl could be a yes. So let me send her. And then she doesn't have to <laughs> come into this darkness. And um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's all different. That's so interesting. Um, I was going to ask, um, there was a, a story that I, I think, you had said in the book about him playing a certain song whenever he would make love to people. <laughs> what song is that? Oh my gosh. That's the Madonna. It was, I think it started out like the material girl sound like album. Yeah. The whole album. Just whole that album. was, just that was, it was Madonna play. every time. Yeah. And I think Hef was, well, I know Hef was hard of hearing, so I don't know how much of it he really heard, but I remember in the book, I talked about, you know, I'm not putting any other CD in here because I don't want any other songs to remind me of this stuff. So Madonna, 10 years of Madonna. <laughs> and there, <laughs> oh, I actually, I, I give you a lot of credit because that's a smart way of thinking about it. Like, I'm going to play this song just so it doesn't, this will be the song that just gives me the bed or that memory. And I don't want to ruin any other experience. Like, I kind of actually give you a lot of credit. Like, I'm only going to stick to this song. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've definitely been in a grocery store and like Ma- the Madonna songs come on. I'm like, <laughs> have oh, a little God. PTSD with Madonna oh, these weird. days. Yeah. <laughs> one of, the one thing also, you know, I, I didn't know about when you did have sex with Hugh Hefner and like obviously there'd be other women there. He used baby oil, which I got to find. I mean, I hate baby oil. It's so hard to get off. So after you're done, you have you, know, you and a bunch of girls like washing off baby oil. Would he shower after or would he just go to sleep in bed with baby oil on him? The second he Oh, sleeping with baby oil? Oh, it oh. feels so dirty. <laughs> yeah, dude, that is so weird. Just to go to haven't, sleep with baby oil on you? Oh. Haven't they proven like that causes cancer or like the powder? I'm or just something? thinking of all the laundry that you, they have to do at the, the mansion, cleaning baby oil out of sheets. Oh, that just sounds like a nightmare. Baby oil, like disgusting. I, there, it was everywhere in the mansion, like all different rooms. 
like baby oil in all the rooms, just on couches and shit. Mm-hmm. Oh, on like oh. the side table with like a couple of magazines, like the most recent issues. <laughs> <laughs> That's so wild. I mean, but it's it's exactly how you would picture his life being, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, what you would think it would be like inside the mansion, that's the reality of it. Yeah. Like, yeah, like a 70s porn den. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, speaking of porn, because as you guys would be kind of, you'd be you and a few other girls, and you'd always actually... Which is interesting. You actually hoped there'd be other girls there because it, that meant you had to do less work or had to do some stuff. There'd be other girls there. There'd also be porn playing on the TV. Now, there's always been rumors that, and correct, that there was always that there would be gay porn on the TV. Was there ever gay porn playing on the screens? Just to kind of, um, not women. I'm saying men. Yeah, I did not see gay porn myself, but I did see like old school porn where there. Are, all bushy baby oil <laughs> <laughs> yeah shaven and bushy everywhere yeah bushy <laughs> baby oil oh my gosh my dog's snoring wake up um <laughs> and uh yeah lots no of that's cool porn yeah so you'd be it's it's 2016 17 and oh what year did he pass it's yeah 17. it's yeah so it's old school but that's great i mean just it's you paint such a good picture through the whole situation what was the most (laughs) amount of women that would be in there like i gotta it's gotta be such a job for you because again you're not romantically in your head you don't look at it as a you don't look at it as a way for how how would you describe your relationship like if you were to describe it like what what was it to you was it work or was it just part of the job was it just part of the job how was it to you um Surprisingly, like so many women would really want to come upstairs. And I I actually watched an interview yesterday, this girl named Amanda. She said, oh, Crystal shouldn't have been threatened or uh, Melissa or whoever shouldn't be threatened. I just wanted to F him. I just wanted to come upstairs and like, wow, this is very interesting. So people just really wanted to do that. And it's like, all right, go ahead. (laughs) Was it so, maybe it was just the bragging rights or to be able to say I had been with Hugh Hefner, the experience. Or, you know, the experience, whatever it was. Maybe, but uh, yeah, I think maybe the most like five people up there. Dang. Wow. Were you ever afraid that you were going to hurt him? Ooh, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like, is he okay? I don't know. Um. <sighs> I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, oh, is he okay? Uh, I don't know. It just was very like robotic and um, awkward. Um, I felt the most sorry for the twins that would come up because it's like those girls are sisters. That is weird. So the sisters would perform on each other. Yeah. I mean, I don't like it mostly maybe just pretend and stuff, but – it was just sad. I'm like, oh, these are these is this is sisters. Like, I I have two sisters. I can't even. So you know, they would like leave early and try and get out of there. And and I in my mind, I'm like, yeah, you guys go get out of here. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so you yeah. saw these sisters actually kissing each other and just and doing all that. Oh and... yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, <sighs> that so is weird. that is gnarly. It's that sad. is <laughs> it is it's sad. sad. But because now sad. we're all reconnecting, and I'm like, oh, these girls like. It's really sad because you can you can see how this has really affected these girls now. Like they, you, sure. I don't know if you guys saw them on the A and E documentary, but it's it's very very sad. Do you feel I like you have Instagram that common it's, it's cool. bond with all these women now? Like you've got like the war stories to discuss with each other, so it almost brings you guys closer together. A little bit, but it's hard because I think we're all different, and some of us. Some of us that like really ate us internally. And I, I, when I started my podcast, I'm talking to some of these women. I'm like, the, a lot of these women are still trying to heal, you know, in ways I am too. But um, some of us have advanced more than others. And it's really hard to see some people like really struggling. Because mm-hmm. you don't realize when you're young, when you're 21, you just think you know everything or you, you can handle it and you've got it. But now, 
I'm 37 and I look at a 20 yard, I'm like, they're a little baby. Yeah. And it's, it's sad. Is there anything that you would do differently if you went back in time? If you could do stuff over again? Mm, maybe not be so afraid and have more of a voice and be able to stick up for myself more and for the other women more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you when you were with Hef, um, did you feel like you were getting hit on by celebrities because you were Hef's wife? And so it was almost like people were even more excited because you're the thing that they can't touch, if that makes sense? Uh, I think it was the opposite. I think that they were afraid to get their invite rescinded. So they were, if anything, I felt safer in that mm-hmm. way that I wasn't being like groped on by by people all the time. You know, I have friends that had it a lot worse. One of my friends, she actually sent me a video a couple of days ago. She was literally just taking a video of the buffet like and then this guy had come up was like give me some come here like just gross and i didn't experience to that extent um but yeah i got preyed upon less because Mm -hmm. people wanted to be respectful of that yeah what celebrity do you think took advantage of the playboy mansion the most meaning not just the women i'm saying like uh, food to the party i'm gonna go there and hang out who's the guy you saw hanging out a lot there were a lot of people that were there a lot um some of them i'm still friends with and friendly with people i would see all the time would be Corey feldman uh polly shore uh jeremy piven um you know the entourage people were there quite often so random but Vern troyer was there so much oh yeah (laughs) he was there all the time yeah, he uh, definitely was there a lot. Um, Jared Leto was there a lot. Um, there were a lot of different people that were there pretty often. And some Did of Hef- them I still talk to. Yeah. Did Heffy actually know who these people were or he just didn't even know what was going on? He's like, yeah, just come. I don't care. Or is someone like, hey, this person's relevant. They should be allowed in. He liked people that were relevant. He liked celebrities. He he had his favorites. You know, he loved Bill Maher. They were very close, and um, Jimmy Kahn. And there was, there are certain people that he really had a soft spot for, and he was closer to. But anyone that was a celebrity, he loved celebrities, so he would he would invite them. So he was his brother was he also like enjoying himself with multiple women there, or was he kind of the exact opposite of you? Keith Hef's brother. Yeah. It's interesting because people don't talk about Keith that much. Uh, but Keith was there almost every day. And he was a part of the Playboy Clubs with Hef. And it's interesting because Hef was a fan of blonde, white women. And Keith more liked Asian women. And so it was perfect because <laughs> anyone, you know, like they're, they're not going after the same girl. Um, but I definitely saw Keith go through his rounds of women for sure. But they, they yeah. were just, they're, they're both uh, playboys, I guess. <laughs> so yeah. I wanted to ask you about kind of a, an infamous moment when paparazzi caught you uh, selling your ring. Oh, my goodness. So that that became a really big news story about because it was like them saying it was a ninety thousand dollar ring you were selling it they caught you do you do you know how they knew it or was there a tip off or was there anything that went down um, that gave them advance notice? Well, first off, the ring was about like forty thousand or fifty thousand, and Mary had got it from Discount Valley Jewelers. So it was like just in the jeweler in the valley. Yeah. And so <laughs> it wasn't 90,000. <laughs> um, I don't know. This this gives me a little PTSD because I, I, I thought, okay, I don't know what to do with this. Do I sell it? Yeah. Do I whatever? And it made it like seem that I was like desperate for money or something, which wasn't the case. Uh, I just wanted to get rid of it. And I had a friend I went to high school with that owned a jewelry store in San Diego. And he said, you come down here. We'll take a look at it. Maybe we'll buy it from you. 
And I'm like, okay, somewhere I feel safe and not attacked from everyone. And I don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, so I, I can go to this person's jewelry store if they want it, they can, they can buy it and whatever. So I go down there and I'm talking to them and my little friend seems a bit nervous. And then TMZ like pops out and in my face, why are you here? What are you, you're selling this ring? What are you doing? And so I immediately ran out, I'm crying and the guy accidentally calls me, my high school friend. And I realize he's called me by mistake. And I hear him talking to the TMZ people. I didn't realize that, you know, oh, she, she was in on it. She was, she was in on us. Like she, she was aware she was somehow she knew this was happening. So I'm like, oh, this guy set me up. He completely set uh... me up for a shout out for his jewelry store. So my own high school friend just completely threw me under the bus and called paparazzi on me to try because I was going to sell the ring. I was going to say, because San Diego is not a spot where paparazzi are normally no. at. So. No, they called him to try and get attention on the jewelry store. And um, when Hef and I got married for real for the, the second time, um, Hef bought me another ring. <laughs> it's like similar, same thing. And I still have it. Yeah. Because it's like, what do I do with it? Yeah. I mean, if you guys have any ideas, I, what do you do? Like, do you just hang on to it forever? I don't I mean, want I feel it. like it's a, a keepsake at this point. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it might have some strange memories tied to it, but it is a, a keepsake, right? Yeah, I, I guess. Like, I mean, I'll, maybe... it'll be here until, I don't know. I maybe, feel like every other house is getting broken into in LA. <laughs> so. Maybe the the metal gets melted down and you redo something with the diamonds and give to a, a child one day, your daughter. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? So. Until then, I'll just have so now, you never look at it. <laughs> so now, though, you're dating. Last time I saw you, I saw you a few months ago. When I say I saw you, I saw you on uh, on some websites. You're dating a, a young kid, a young guy now. Oh my gosh! Yeah, the um, the the tennis player, the student, the Columbia. He's like 23 years old. So sweet, right? He's 24. 24. You're, you're are you still I dating know. the 24 year old guy? No, 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 no. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, um, I sorry, about it, but I was like, where the? How did this kid meet this girl? Because here you, I mean, so interesting, right? Do you want to know where we met? Right. I would love to know. Oh, you met on Raya. Yeah. So, what was his? Uh, how did he get your attention? Um, just sending me a what? message, and I looked at um, pictures, and I'm like, "Oh, this seems like a really nice, kind person." And then I saw the age, and I said, "Hey, you know, I'm, you know, I'm older than you." And then it was just, I know, and I didn't mention it after after that, and you know, hung out a few times. Super nice person. Like, I really appreciate you know, the time I had and, you know, it was more of like a friend's thing. And, um, what I have noticed from dating somebody younger in that way is that I feel like my age range, we kind of grew up with all these like misogynistic movies and this, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of hard. And that generation is, is more, I don't know, like it felt a little bit more respectful. So even for a brief moment in time, that was just really nice to experience. Is it is it hard to date? Do you feel like it's intimidating for people um, because you were da- you were married to Hugh Hefner? Is that is that like a tough pill for people to swallow? Or it hasn't been. Uh, I do have friends that are playmates, and they say that they get judged by the Playboy stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Kendra Wilkinson also said it was hard to date because of her Playboy past. But maybe because I wasn't so ingrained and I wasn't on the show for like five seasons and I was just on part of it. And I haven't had any problem with that. Nobody is really. Yeah. That's good. But, what, uh, but it's, it's been you, hard. Dating. <laughs> are you, so you're single now? I'm uh, definitely single dating ish. and trying. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely dating now and just trying to surround myself with very kind, em- emotionally mature people. <laughs> are you sticking? Yeah. Do you do you date mostly using Raya? Because maybe people don't even like people in the Midwest may not even know what Raya is. Adam, do you want to explain what Raya is to people? I mean, I'm I'm, I'm not on Raya. Raya, you have to be 
Rye is a, you have to sort of have, you got to get Exclusive dating on. site, right? Yeah, it's exclusive dating site. You have to have a good amount of followers. You have to be in the game. You have to be cool. How would you explain Raya, Crystal? I guess um, a lot of people on there or are, usually they're either like really hot or they're a celebrity or they're like really rich. It's never like a combination of all three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um. But yeah, like if you have a cool, quirky kind of job, like you'll probably get on Raya. If you like have some cool photos or like a cool, cool like things about you that they they like to have eclectic groups of people and they like to have like uh, they like to have celebrities on there. They like to have you know successful people. They like to have good looking people. Just have you ever matched with an, uh, another celebrity? Yeah, there's celebrities on there, like quite a, a few of them. of them. And they Who'd try and hide with? on there. What? Who would you match with? Just the randomest. There's the randomest. <laughs> <laughs> You're like fucking Corey Feldman out. once again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Corey Feldman. I can't leave this guy. He's always there. That's um, so funny. There's been like, there's been quite a few. I've seen... Yeah, I've seen Ben Affleck on there. I've seen Owen Wilson on there. I've seen all kinds of people on there. So yeah. Crazy. Are you, when you obviously part of the, I don't know if this goes in the prenup, how much money did you walk away from this relationship with Hugh Hefner with? Like, did, are you, do you have to work again? I know you're part of the, his foundation and you might even, I don't know, question, I question, well, I don't question him. I'm, I'm curious if you took, if you take a salary from working at the foundation, but also do you still have to work for like, or are you financially like comfortable? Um, I mean, I like working. I I've had my real estate license since 2008. You know, I was, I was very lucky. My mom is a broker and my stepdad was, you know, vice president at Merrill Lynch in San Diego. And so I remember saying to him like, or asking him, how much money do I need to start a Merrill Lynch account? And he's like, $200,000, like one day. <laughs> um, so once I was able to get the money and Merrill Lynch and that, that grew and with real estate, I started buying and selling while I was at the mansion. And um, just before COVID, I had around eight properties between wow. like West Hollywood and Malibu. And Good yeah, for I, you. I, Damn. I, I, thank you. I flip houses. It's fun. I now I'm working on some passion projects in Hawaii. Like I'm developing three different properties in Hawaii on the Big Island, and it's fun because you know if I'm not working, what am I doing? You know, I'm just <laughs> yeah. yeah it's fun. Uh, I have I have one last question for you. My question okay. is. Walking like now that you're done with this book, it's about to come out. The world is about to read it. What are you most proud of? I think when I started writing the book, I just I just wish there were that there was a book like it when I was 21 and when I was going into the mansion and I could have someone else's story and be able to read it and know what I was getting into, and. I think I've written the book that I wish I would have read when I was 21. And I think it's a book that will help young girls. And I think that's what I'm most proud of. Well, that's a great answer. Thank you. And uh, what, what, tell us about your podcast. You know, this is something that's probably a passion project for you. It's a hobby for you. You enjoy doing it, but um, why should people check out your podcast and what can they expect from your podcast? Uh, well, I'm very introverted and I don't get out much. So I thought a podcast would be a good idea to start using my voice and start talking to people and hearing other people's stories. And um, the idea of the podcast is once the book launches that I will go chapter by chapter and kind of have guests on from each chapter and just, just go through it. Um, yeah, I'm going to have my mom on, my best friend from childhood, and then probably the Shannon twins. Yeah, so... Yeah, I just think it would be nice to have some commentary on the book and hopefully have the podcast as a platform to help people. Because I, kn I know not everyone experienced the Playboy Mansion, but other people have experienced certain types of, you know, power imbalance or abuse and, you know, <laughs> narcissism, misogyny. Like, so I, I hope to help those people. Well, I want to wish you a lot of success in your book release. Um, 
Listen, Adam has been your number one fan on this book, uh, constantly Adam. talking about it on a daily basis. So uh, I know he's he's piqued my interest. I want to. I told him I'm like you got to send it out to me so I can read it now. Um, I would love to spend the time because of just how excited he is every single time we talk about like, oh my God, and she said this, and then she said this. So uh, I think people are most likely going to really be enjoying your perspective of living in the Playboy Mansion in your life. And uh, so I, I wish you a lot of success in this book release. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I'm honored that you read it, Adam. So thank you so much. No, it's awesome. Congrats. It's a, it's, it's honestly, it's a very, I read a lot of Playboy books. I shouldn't say a lot. I read like maybe two, maybe two. I definitely read one. Books or magazines? Was, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> articles. He means, uh, he I means read articles. I forget it. You know what? I read a book about a girl who grew up in the Playboy Man. This was like years ago. I forget the, the book. Oh, this Jennifer play- Sagnor? Yes, Playground. yes, yes. I did read that. And But this was a great read. I th- and it, But not just a great read where it's interesting. It's well written. And that's kudos to you. Um, I think that's the difference maker. It's just a very well written book. So you have a lot to be proud of. Congratulations. I think it's a really, really great perspective. So thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Uh, Dax, thoughts? It was great. I mean, it was fun. It, a fun perspective. Um, I, I'm excited to see how this book does because I think it's going to get a shit ton of press. People, She's talking about all the things that people have <clears throat> been curious about for years and years and years. And she doesn't seem to have the, the, the fear or the filter that, you know, you would think. And that's mm-hmm. kind of what's awesome about it. She's like, Hey, this is my life. This, this is what you get. <laughs> you know, you're, you're talking about having sex with Hugh Hefner and she's kind of cringing. People aren't going to see that when they're listening to the podcast, but she's kind of cringing at certain points. When we're talking about, you know, um, baby oil and this and that, and you can see her like cringing, like talking about it. And so I think there's some memories in there that she's like, ah, maybe it's not my proudest moment in my life, but like, she doesn't regret it. You know, she's, she's living her truth. Yeah. I think what I respect most is she understands our curiosity in it. Yeah. You know, the questions we ask from the sex to kissing to all that stuff, they're warranted. You know, they're, we're curious about it. We don't, I, I hope people, the, the audience knows we ask these questions out of pure curiosity, not out of or we try to be not out of filth, but it's, dude, it's a, it's a that wild life. She lived it. And yeah. again, Hugh Hefner is no longer with us, but I hope people walk away with a different perspective on him. I mean, me, I still find them, you know, he, he was a very unique He's and very interesting iconic guy. He's, He's a, a very fascinating human being is at the end of the day, put aside some of the, the weirdness. He, it, He's still a successful, fascinating human being, whether you liked what he did or what he produced, all of that kind of stuff. But growing up, I didn't think it was weird. But now that I'm older and more mature and kind of more conscious of things like, yeah, that's a little strange. Yeah, that's a little weird. And if that kind of if that lifestyle happened today, you know, Hugh Hefner was accepted. If there was a new Hugh Hefner coming out today, I don't think it would be as accepted. Yeah, it wouldn't be accepted. No yeah. chance. So. Um, well, guys, right. thank you for checking out the podcast. Uh, Dax, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, uh, make sure you guys follow us on social media. We've got an awesome Facebook group called Off the Record. You can find us. Um, you got to answer a couple questions and we'll accept you into our private Facebook group. Uh, but there you can chat, sound off on the episode, whether you love something, whether you hated something, whether we mess something up. Uh, everyone lets us know in our private Facebook group where we are interacting with you all uh you can follow us on our other social media platforms instagram tiktok uh, twitter youtube our show is on youtube uh, but you can follow me at dax holt you can follow adam at adam glenn and uh, obviously hollywood raw you can find as well so thank you guys for listening hope you enjoyed this episode we will see you later later what's up guys if you like that video there's plenty more that came from make sure you like subscribe hit the bell so we can just feed you all the goodness daily. Hurry up, come on, let's go.